artist's hand has carried with them the threads of a continuous tradition, that is, clarity of form. have the ability and the justification to change such forms. Ninety-five years old, Sadar Gurcharan Singh is the grandfather figure behind studio pottery in India. <laughs> In the picturesque little village of Andreta, in the Kangra Valley of Himachal Pradesh, Kurcharanji has made his home. I came to Andreta in uh, 49. See, because Sova Singh, this artist was Delhi there, he asked me to come and then first time I came here. And then I used to come every other year to Sova Singh, stay for a couple of weeks. And, so, and then why not to make a house here? So then I want to buy land, I couldn't buy it. So people don't sell it. So we went on searching for another 10 or 12 years. Mm. Then in 1960, you see, no Richard went to uh, Delhi. And she rang me up that I have come here and stayed there all day. And she was very happy to see the pottery. She said, you come, you put your finger to any place, I will give you there. In 61, I made a house. Then you have been coming almost every year. As a fresh young graduate in geology in 1918, Kurcharanji came to Delhi from Gujranwala. Uh, one thing I tell you, you can escape anything you like, but you can't escape your destiny, what you are destined to be. <laughs> Otherwise, I could have become a pottery, see. Born in a family of engineer and not knowing. When uh, somebody predicted that I will have my bread out of clay, I never believed him. Here he first came into contact with the Afghan potter Abdullah, a descendant of the craftsmen who flourished in the reign of the Tughlaqs and the Lodis. I, I come Delhi to say no, I didn't want to go into pottery. Okay. And then I stayed with a friend of my father who wanted to send me to Japan for the training and this and that. Mm. But I didn't want to go. So I say, I was, father said, you go and say no, I can't say no, you go do it. <laughs> so I came to Delhi. And in the morning, he took me to the uh, workshop. And Abdullah was sitting and making these pots. And I never came back. <laughs> <coughs> Next day, I made him my teacher, gave him one turban and five rupees and uh, sweet meats, and said, You be my guru. So he was good. And then we were together for 40 years. Oh. He's a very nice man, very nice man. When there was work, he would work up 9 or 10 o'clock in the night on the electric light. And when there was work, he would put a bed and sleep outside the tree. <laughs> Very nice man. Uh, now, what is on there? Cotton. Uh, you don't see. Uh. <laughs> see, the room is very nice. Yeah. When the uh, green field of the rice is there, yeah. mm. beautiful little. Gurcharanji went to Japan in 1919 to study pottery. There he was fortunate to have worked with three famous potters of the period, Bernard Leach, Tomimoto and Hamada. He did a technical school in which they teach pottery. Mm. I joined there for two years. And for one year I worked in different places to get some experience. And then before I came, I had an exhibition there. Uh, uh, there's photographs in my book also that. Of that exhibition? Yes. And you worked with uh, Bernard Leach? In Bernard Leach, I, I was used to go to his uh, studio almost every weekend, you see. But he left uh, 21. Then he went to England. He got enough for there to take a studio there, so he went there. See, Ahmad was a student, like a student working there. Then he accompanied him to England and worked there several years with him. Mm -hmm. 
uh, once I asked my teacher, which was the best place to learn art pottery, he said, you go to Korea. So I went there. I was there for three months. Mm -hmm. There's a huge uh, pot they make. And very natural way, just as a mountain stream flows, you see, the pots flow out of the see, uh, workshop like that. Ceramics, as we know, involves so much knowledge and information and uh, practical experience to use the various ingredients for glazing non-glazed pottery, biscuiting and so on and so forth. Now he was certainly an expert in this. He, in the early days he went to Japan. Japan was then the place for most artistic uh, art pottery because each item produced used to be in work of art itself. On his return, Gurcharanji, along with his teacher and friend Abdullah, set about making glazed ceramic tiles and jalis. Some of Gurcharanji's conspicuous work, like that in the Fort Foundation building, Shankar's Dolls Museum and the Imperial Hotel testify to his love for one color, the Delhi Blue. Originally it is from uh, Egypt. 5,000 years back they made this color in glass mm. for an enamel of so silver and gold jewelry. Oh, okay. See, yeah. you melt and put glass enamel, you see. And uh, this is a color which is used much copper. Sand of the Nile River mm. with borax and copper. So I traveled all over the country over route, over land, to find out this color came to India. See, I went from this place to Kabul, mm. and from Kabul to Iran and Iraq, and then to Egypt. I went to Egypt. You went all alone or with somebody? Bendre was with us, and one or two more artists, my wife, and four or five of us. Traveling from Egypt through Afghanistan, glazed blue tiles came to India, with the Pathan kings. For good Charanji, it was the beginning of an inspiration. Mm. Delhi Blue Art Pottery, a name synonymous with good Charanji, was established at Factory Road. The house come studio was a reflection of his personality. Here, he began his life as a potter 75 years ago. Repeated requests to the government to allow him to keep his land was denied. This forced him to demolish his house to make adequate space for the classes. Kucharanji has been an enthusiastic teacher and has always maintained that his art is actually a gift which he must pass on.
जब इसका काटेंगे ना इसको इसका एक थोड़ा फुट गा लेना तो आर इंची उसका फायदा ये होता है कि आप फुट हो तो उसको उससे ग्रेज लगा सकते इसके यू डोंट पुट योर फिंगर ऑन दिस यू होल्ड दउट ऑन द फुट एंड देन यू कैन ग्रेज लाइक दिस When the glaze is centered, the movement of the you see, wheel makes it shapes. You see, the the old model saying that the pot makes itself. You only guide it with your hand, uh, subconsciously, not consciously, because you don't see it how it is going. You see, so uh, so centering is very important. It's the instinct in you which goes on guiding your hand, and you go with it. The pot makes itself. He was the oldest, and probably at the time the only studio partner that India had, and he had relentlessly worked to serve this medium and developed it to a great extent. When once I told him that I want to do a mural in ceramic, he was very. Cooperative and offered me all the facilities of his of his workshop to work in. I believe there are very few people in India who could be given credit for having served the medium when there was little awareness of it. Thadar Guru Charan Singh Ji is one of these rare people. Sometimes guys would just come and sit. We used to be lovely benches there under that neem cafe, and he just sit there and talk about his times in Japan and his and his love for clay and for pottery. Even now, it's lovely actually when he's sitting here. One is very aware of clay because if you are getting a little bit a little bit of clay has fallen, he will say pick it up. You know, one tends to sort of say ठीक है गिरी या कोई बात नहीं. But he says this is precious as well. So a little trimming or something, you know, one. Up and um, collects it, and it's all recycled eventually. But he had a, that. I hope I cannot say yet, but I hope that fondness and the love for it, I would attribute much to him. It's the way he holds the pot with so tenderly. I really wanted to get into the navy. Once I went for my exams and everything, went to the merchant navy, and I was declared colorblind at the range of three miles. My father has already got the pottery going here in Delhi. So in '58 I joined him <coughs> and started potting for a year with him. Then '59 I went to England to work with Bernard Leach, where I spent a year. Then later I visited France and Germany with the pottery there, and uh, I came back in '61. I had my first show same year in Jaipur. In Andhra, we managed to get the Delhi Blue Pottery Trust to give us some funding to build a museum there, and we hope to keep village pottery from the Kangra Valley. See, village pottery is more or less dying in this respect. The younger generation is not in the least interested. They are more studio potters. The studio potters are increasing, while the village potters are decreasing. According to the Manu, a potter son is a potter son. You see, he has not taken that craft, adopted it. Mm. It is bo he is born with it. You see. And he sees his parents making small pottery and clay and all these things, so it becomes natural to him. See, that is the traditional pottery. See, mm. and if you want to learn pottery as a studio potter, you have got to learn it. But they don't learn it; they learn by themselves because then they are brought in that environment, and that environment is a lot of thing to do. You see, 
And then they were once born in a family of reporters, they are reporter always. No other See, in the, in the, in the, in the village, a potter is a very important part of uh, social life. Yes. He makes supports and makes deepaks and makes all these things and supplies them to free. Mm. And then people give them in return, the whole people in the village give in return the crop, you see, when they come. So when the crop comes, you see, they go and they have a share from them. That was the barter system. Barter system. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was. And then you don't pot, pot, find potters in every village. You find in a village where there's some clay, some three or four families. Yes. And then they work there and then supply neighboring village also. But that was the old economy, see. See, I have this room which is special in. But come and stay here. Stay here. But it's still remote. This is the kiln? This is a fire wood kiln. Burn this fire in it. Mm -hmm. The wood is added from there, and the wood is added from there, and goes and burns, and then goes down to the whole to the chimney. Oh. There is a chimney outside. Okay. These slabs are used? Yeah, I put the pottery on the slab. Do you also have an electric kiln? Yes, that's inside. <coughs> Is it necessary to glaze a pot? You see, it is necessary because the glaze is the clothing of it. Otherwise, the body is naked. And then, you see, it makes it waterproof. Mm. And it makes it uh, proof to wear and tear. And it becomes strong also, you see. How do you decide on the color? What glaze? That as it uh, comes to you. You don't pre, uh, see, condition it. As you take the pot, you want to do something. You, it comes in singly to you and do this. You may be right and you may be wrong. <laughs> it may be right. If your instinct is correct for color and balance, then it will be all right. If not, you see, uh, my teacher in Japan used to say, never let anybody glaze your pot. Mm. Because when you take it for glazing, it's almost a finished thing. If it's not good enough, break it. But, uh, and give it a judicious glaze also, you see. Not over glazing, not, uh, you see, overdoing thing and the colors everything. They should be simple and, uh, see, uh, just, after all, what is the painting? It is the filling of the space. Now, you have a space here. You have to fill it. You have to fill it in a judicious manner, it is not overdone. This design that he has made, where is it from? This is a typical kagra. How will the glazing be done? Because the traditional potters don't glaze as you told No, this will be glazed. They will put it, pour the glaze inside and go inside glaze and pour it out. Oh. And then you see, uh, hold it and then pour the glaze like this. And then you see, after that drink glaze is dry, then they dip it into the glaze, the mouth. It will be a different color? Yes. Here it will be a different glaze and here different glaze. <laughs> that is the vehicle of a Gresh. Yes. He's, he's very fond of making these. You are not to ask him to do this. He will do whatever he likes to do. But he makes something which is beautiful. Yes. Because it's a, she has been trained from, I think, several generations like that. Now you have formed a trust. That I have put somebody so that it can be village potters can be helped to see. Scholarship can be to them. And you see, the uh, most difficult thing for a modern uh, studio potter is to have his own fundraising, which costs about 25,000. So we said the trust will give an easy, you see, it's all in basis uh, uh, for this money, you see, so that they can pay it by installment and use it. That is the trust I agree. When I die, everything which I hold, I have, which I have, it becomes a trust, not uh, oh, I everything. But I think uh, for the survival of this craft uh, in uh, tradition, we have to, uh, you see, change the working method of the traditional pottery. Mm. Because he has got the uh, natural gift to make pottery, mm. but he hasn't got the means to glaze it. Yeah. 
has gone to means where you see a market it. Gurcharanji's concerns and creations subtly reflect his underlying simple philosophy. Each object has a definite purpose in its beauty and functionality. Difference between other crafts and this craft. See where it is visually put here. Mm. You see the beauty of it. Yes. There's a view of sense. Mm. But when you take it here, it is another sense, sensual, you see. Because it becomes a very intimate with the touch. You want to hold it like this. See, that is sensual. Yes. Texture and holding and the weight of it and the contour of it. Mm. That gives you another message when you hold it in your hand. That's why you see a pottery should be so priced that you should be able to use it, not to put it in a lavara and like that. I have never put my price of a pot more than five or six hundred. Never so far. I think one, it was big one, I told price of one, so eight hundred rupees, that's all. But now, you see, if you don't use it, what is the idea of having a hybrid pottery? Yes. Making a slab. Hmm, it's called slab. It's called uh, making by slab. Hmm. Hmm. See, that's not round, you see. So it yeah. can't go on that bottle. Oh. Any shape which is not round, you see, can't be made. Does it come out easily from the mold? Yes, yes, because you see this uh, plaster of Paris has the quality of absorbing the wa water moisture. Mm. So when the water is absorbed, see, it becomes more stiff. So this is, this will absorb the water. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This also becomes porous. Yes. Just like you treat your child, you see. After all, it is your creation. It's your child. You can't force it.
No, it will drive her for his or six hours. Thank you. 